Hello, and we're back with a new Sunday school lesson for Sunday, uh, our week of uh, Sunday the 14th, and this will be our lesson. We want to say thank you for being a part of this, but before we begin, let us ask God to bless us as we study this together. Dear Lord, here we are once again gathered together to study this lesson. Lord, we ask that will you please give us listening ears and a receiving heart so that we might be able to better understand this lesson that is for our benefit. And Lord, we want to ask a special blessing on the bereaved and sick everywhere. Please, Lord, have mercy on the people in this world. And Lord, have mercy on the people that are in control and running this world. We, we ask you, Lord, to please uh, remember all of us. And Lord, we thank you for this lesson and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I said, we have a great lesson and so that it's not very long. So let's just switch over and let's start looking at what we're studying. As you can see, we're talking about Jesus is God. This is unit two, confirmed by mighty miracles. And this is lesson seven out of the Union Gospel Press book. And our topic or subject of our lesson is Jesus's authority over demons. The time, A.D. 26, uh, the place possibly near Mount Hermon. And it's coming out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 14 through 29. And as our Bible reference, we'll be using the New Living Translation. Our golden text comes from verse 24 of Mark, the ninth chapter, and it reads, What do you mean, if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is, anything is possible if a person believes. And the King James reads like this. It says, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe it. All right. And as you can see, our lesson consists of three outlines. The first one, a needy son, that's verse 14 through 20. And the second one, a believing father, verse 21 through 24. And the third one, a powerful savior, uh, verse 25 through uh, 29. So as we can see that this lesson is dealing with Jesus's authority over demons. And our lesson begins at verse uh, 14. But if you go back and start at the beginning of chapter nine, there was uh, Jesus and he took his uh, three uh, faithful disciples, uh, the three that were closest to him, Peter, James and John. And they went, he left the other disciples down at the foot of the mountain. So he wanted to take Peter and James and John so that uh, he could uh, reveal something to them that the others were not quite ready to uh, see. So as he goes up there, they if you go back and read it, this is where he talks about the uh, transfiguration on this mountain. Now, they were up there and they witnessed some magnificent uh, sayings and uh, seen some visions that they had were just in awe about. And they saw Jesus in another dimension. And he was uh, white. The one writer said there was no, no laundry. No one could wash something to make this white as what Jesus appeared to these three disciples as he appeared to them. And the disciples were so overwhelmed with all what they saw in the time that they were there that they, uh, the one I'm spoke of, the main one that always speaks up, and that's Peter. Peter said, Lord, 
Let us be of three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. And we just stay up here and 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 and, and, and always be in this midst of what's going on. But now when Jesus answered him, he told him, no, the work is down at the at the bottom. The work is not here at the top. And so as they proceeded down the mountain, now they had been up there for about, I think, six days somewhere I read. So that was a long time and a lot of a lot of things were revealed to these three disciples. But Jesus, as they on their way down, he tells them, do not reveal what you saw to anyone else. Be why? Because they were not ready to receive it. And Jesus didn't want a confusion among the disciples. And as Jesus and these three are coming down the uh, mountain, they see a big crowd and they hear some loud voices. In other words, a commotion going on. And there, uh, there was some arguing that uh, the disciples were involved in. So let's, this is where our lesson picks up. So let's switch over and see what is going on and we'll be through with this because it's a short lesson. Now, as you can see, it talks about a needy son and it reads, and when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. Verse 15, when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. Verse 16, what is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. Verse 17, one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son to you so you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Verse 18, and whenever this spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and become rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't. Verse 19, Jesus said to him, your, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. In verse 20, so they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, uh, withering and foaming at the mouth. Now, isn't that a sight? Now, Jesus just was up on this mountain uh, of transfiguration. He was talking with Moses and Elijah and in his glory was revealed to the three disciples and they had a they just had a great time up there but they Jesus knew that there was something going on and the work at, was not in the mountain but down at the foot and as they were returning after these 6 days and as they were coming down Jesus look what he says when Jesus returned with the uh, to the other disciples he saw this large crowd and they probably was pushing and shoving the disciples and questioning him. Well, when it, when it's all said and done, when he saw this, he asked the question, just, just as a parent would do when their children get into an argument and start uh, screaming and shoving and hollering. Uh, my mother would say, hey, what's that noise? Cut that out. You, you, what's going on in here? And this is what Jesus did. Just as Jesus, Peter, James, and John, was returning from a six-day mountaintop experience, they see the scribes arguing with the disciples. Not, not, now, the crowd is mummering and probably egging and on, but this was an opportunity for the scribes to uh, put the disciples on, on, on blast because they saw that they couldn't heal this man's son, so they, they started uh, criticizing him. And and they probably was uh, ragging them and saying, yeah, you know, see y'all claim y'all can do this and y'all like that Jesus, that Jesus person going around. Why you couldn't do it? And in it, 
That type of argument and going on benefits no one, not no one, not to help the boy. It didn't help the disciples. It didn't help the people around and it didn't even uh, help the uh, scribes. So the scribes were criticizing the disciples because they couldn't heal the boy. Now, out of all the work that the uh, scribes, that Jesus and his disciples were doing, the scribes could pick out and critique them on things that they should have been able to do themselves since they were great religious teachers. They knew about demons and how uh, you're supposed to uh, be able to ask God to heal somebody, but this wasn't the case. So when when Jesus saw the crowd, he was overwhelmed. They were they were overwhelmed when all oh, because they figured, okay, here come Jesus. It's going everything gonna be all right. It is being it's gonna be fixed because here come the man that's in charge. And then look what he said. Then he asked them what they were arguing about. And the disciples probably fell quiet because they they didn't know what to do, but they knew it once Jesus was on the scene, he was gonna take care of it. But in this case, uh one the person the scribes didn't say what they were arguing about because no because see they they had the upper hand then but there was a man in the crowd that spoke up and this man was the reason for this big disturbance because he brought his son to these to Jesus but Jesus wasn't there but he thought that since these were some of his followers they could help his son and this is what they and he spoke up. And it says, one of the men in the crowd spoke up with and said, teacher, I brought my son so you, you could heal him. He is possessed with an evil spirit. The King James says a demon. Now, this is the father talking to Jesus. Now, don't forget, he already asked this from the disciples. He says, um, he, he's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. That's why I said dumb. He, This demon had possessed this boy to where he had full control over his bodily functions. The boy couldn't even speak. And then, and, and then he goes on and explains this whole thing. He says, whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and become rigid. That means he, he, when he when he's got full control of him, he put this boy in an epileptic seizure that he has no control. He says um, he grinds his teeth and he's rigid. That means he's stiff. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Now, this is the father. He's he's desperate. He's ready for his son to be taken care of. He's got he has some faith. He's thinking that if I take him here, that it's going to be done. And then look, look what Jesus says. He says, uh, uh, look what he says that, uh, he says, Jesus said to them, he's, now Jesus is talking not just to the father. He's talking to everybody around, the disciples, the scribes, the father, and the, the crowd of folks that are, you know, where people have a following and people just following for their own entertainment. And Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Now, ain't this something our Lord is saying, how, how long I got to put up with you? He says, bring, bring the boy to me. Now, Jesus is upset with these disciples. He's upset uh, with the, the scribes. He's upset. Uh, pretty upset with the man because he's saying you you all have seen all the works that I have done and you still don't believe. He says, "What? Well, how long am I going to eat?" And the New Living says, "Put up with you." He's like, "How much longer? That what else do I need to do to prove to you who I am?" So they brought the boy to Jesus because he said, "Bring him to me." He says, "Bring bring bring me the boy." In other words. Jesus is finna show him his authority that he has authority even over evil spirits. And the new, uh, the King James says, uh, demons. Jesus has authority over everything, even in your life. He has authority over everything. There is nothing impossible that he cannot do. 
And then he says, so they brought the boy to him. And when the evil spirit uh, saw Jesus, it threw, look, look what he says. He threw the child into a violent convulsion. Because see, the spirit knew that he was, after a while, he going to have to go. He, but he figured like, let me, let me, let me cast him down and show him my power. He's, the demon is showing Jesus his power. Well, you showing your power that you can do everything without the Lord, but the Lord has power over everything. And throwing to the ground into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground and look, he started foaming at the mouth. Now this, this is a sight to be seen. And in our day, we would think that he's having a, a seizure. But in this time and culture, they looked at it as being a, a demon, an evil spirit. And in their culture, the, the Pharisees, uh, uh, the scribes felt like, well, they couldn't remove, they couldn't call this demon out because he didn't know the demon's name because the demon had locked the boy's mouth to where he couldn't speak. But in that time, they felt like the only way they, now th this is really just a, uh, an excuse that they use, that they couldn't call out this demon because they didn't have the right name. So there are many demons and they all have names. But when you, God gives you a power to, and authority to do something, you don't need the name of it. You just need to believe and do what you need to do. He says, in our culture today, like I said, we would uh, diagnose this as an epileptic seizure. But in Jesus, uh, here saw that the boy condition was caused by a dynamic, uh, demonic possession. Jesus already knew. He said, now this ain't no seizure. This is not just something the boy is mentally ill. This is a demon. And then he says, look, and, and so they brought him to him and he fell down to the ground. This is when Jesus saw all this. And he, he, he was like, that poor man was just unreal. He couldn't believe they couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Well, this demon had so much power that the disciples, even though Jesus had given them authority over unclean spirit, and you can find that in Mark 6 and 7, this demon was more powerful than them. And this demon, as well as others, can be stronger. And they and that is uh this one was more stubborn and intimidating than others. This one was arrogant. This demon was just going to do what he wanted. He going to show everybody. He going to show Jesus this. And that's why the little boy, he made him drop to the ground and start foaming at the mouth and all this. This was a demonstration that the demon could show the people that he had more power than, uh, than Jesus. And that's why I say it talks about him. This was the neatest son. Okay, now let's switch over and look at our next outline. And as we can see, this is a believing father. And this is where Jesus is going to start talking. And it says here, and this is verse 21 through 24. It says, how long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire or into water, trying to kill him. Look, the father, have mercy on us and help us. If you can, Jesus says, what do you mean? If I can, Jesus asked, anything is possible if a person believes. In verse 24, the father instantly cried out. He said, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. How many of us have found ourselves in that same predicament and asking the Lord to help us? And he said, well, Jesus really was concerned about this boy. He's been, okay, well, how long, how, how long has this been going on? He, he, Jesus already knew this, y'all, but he wanted to, he was asking them, how long was this child acting like this? And look, the father, the, nobody else is talking, just the father and Jesus. And he says, since he was a, a little boy, this has been going on. Even the father went in and explained all what this is, how this has affected the child. At one time, he says, when it came on him, he threw him in the fire. And then even at times he tried to throw him in the water. He would throw him in the water, hoping that he would die. And, and that let me know that the father kept a close watch on his son. 
He loved him that much that he didn't want this evil spirit to take his son away from him. And I'm sure when he threw him in the fire, the father was there to reach in and grab him. Or when he tried to throw him in the water to uh, drown him, the father would be there to grab him. And, and he, he did this because he wanted his son saved. Just like the Lord is always there to reach in and grab us when we falter and we make mistakes. But then he says, um, look, he says, then he says, he says, when he said, if you can, he throwed a little doubt. The doubt was that, well, I know you, Jesus. I've saw some of your works or I've heard some of your works. And I believe that you are Jesus but I really don't know if you can help him. But if if you can, that's what the if comes in to represent that uh, if you do it, Lord, if, 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 if is, is the, it was that he lacked full confidence. And then look what he says. Jesus says, well, what do you mean if I can? He says, if you believe, if Jesus turns if back around, he says, anything is possible if a person believes. You got to believe that the Lord is who he say he is and to believe this. And he's talking about when he talked about how he immediately do this. See, this demon knew that Jesus, who Jesus was and, and the power that Jesus had. So the demon who was on the inside of the boy, he wanted to look, he wanted to cause more harm. Like I said, he, he wanted to show his power that he could. He could overrule Jesus and take over. And then when Jesus see all this, he's looking at it like, wait a minute. So he goes into that. And the father was unsure if Jesus could uh, could do anything. He was, he was just unsure if he, after all, his disciples couldn't do it. See, that's part of the reason the father had a little doubt. Because these disciples, and they're supposed to be with Jesus and have the same ability. He felt like, wait a minute, well, maybe they can't do it. But, but when the father said, if, he was not sure if Jesus could actually do it. The father believed in Jesus. He believed in his power. But he also knew that his own, it, that his own doubt. So he, he pleaded with Jesus. He pleaded. It let me know that the man seemed unsure if Jesus could do anything, but if wasn't in regards to what Jesus could do. The if was in regards to the man's faith. So Jesus told him, if you can believe, he says, all things are possible to him who believes. And when we trust God as true and all promises are true, all things he promises are possible. So this is what he's telling them about if. He's letting them know, don't know. If, come on, come on. Look, the poor father, the poor father in this account was challenged by Jesus's uh, exhortation for faith. He did he did believe in Jesus' power to deliver his son. After all, why else would he have come to Jesus? But he also uh, recognized his doubt. So he tearfully, the man cried out. The text said he cried and pleaded with Jesus, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That's what he was saying. I believe you, Lord. But in the meantime, help me to be stronger in the belief. And that's when the father just instantly cried out because he knew he had that little doubt, but he wanted to, he wanted that to, he wanted Jesus to come on and, and help my unbelief so that I can believe and, and be strong in my belief. Some of us have unbelief and we need to ask God to help our unbelief, renew the right spirit within us so that we won't have this unbelief when things come upon us, all right? So now let's look at uh, the next outline. And as we can see, this one, it, start, it says, a powerful savior. In verse 25, he says, and when Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers and growing 
he rebuked the evil spirit. He flipped what he said. He said, listen, you uh, spirit that makes the boy unable to hear or speak. He said, listen, Jesus says, I command you to come out of this child and never, ever in, enter him again. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy to, into the, another violent convulsion and he left him. The boy appeared to be dead and murmurs ran through the crowd as the people said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet and he stood up. Afterwards, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. So now we see that uh, when Jesus saw the crowd, they was back there murmuring and and the crowd getting bigger and anxious. And Jesus spoke strictly to the demon. He didn't speak to the uh, the believers, but he spoke loud enough so they could see and hear what he was saying. And he told him, he said, he, he told him, come out of this boy. You come out of him and don't you ever go back. But look, now this is such a powerful, intimidating demon. Look, he even had the nerve to cry out. And it says, when Jesus commanded the demon to come out, the demon cried out and caused the boy to uh, go back and, and go back into convulsion and drop to the ground. Then the demon left the boy. He left the boy, but then he going to try one more act. He knew he had to leave. He knew his speed had to hit the rocks. And he, what he going to do? He was afraid, but he felt, well, I got he, he was demanding. He was he was a, a intriguing demon. He was stronger than some of the other demons. He was more intimidating. So what he did, he gonna attack him again. And when the boy fell down, he took off. Isn't that like, isn't that like your adversaries? They can stir up a whole lot of stuff all around you. But the minute you start praying and your faith is renewed, they they leave you alone. They go away. When they see you prospering, when they try to stop you. They don't have nothing to say. They become quiet. And then this is what he says about uh, when he did that. Everybody, everybody that was standing around looking, they thought the boy was dead. They thought, well, well, Jesus didn't really, he caused the boy to die. But that's not true. What did Jesus do? Jesus took the boy, reached down and grabbed the boy's hand and lifted him to his feet. And the boy stood up. So that lets me know when we're in our dilemma and we pray, God will reach down and lift us back up, brush us off and say, my child, I'm with you. And this is what he did with this boy. Now, we don't see what the crowd had to say after all of this, because we know the demon was gone. He 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 has no power around our Lord. He had to, he had to uh, like I said, hit rocks. He had to keep moving. And he had to, uh, cause he had no power like Jesus had the power. And then it says that after all this was done and the crowd dispersed, those uh, antagonizing scribes went on about their way. But then when the disciples went with Jesus to uh, to a house, it don't say whose house was it. Just someone had invited them in for a rest and dinner. But when they got in there, they did. They asked God for uh, some help. Now, they didn't ask him out openly because they, they this was a personal defeat on their part. So they met with him privately and they asked Jesus, Jesus, why couldn't we have done this? A lot of people, when they fail at something, they won't go back and ask God why, why, why I failed. Uh, uh, help me to understand. We just get angry and want to carry that grudge and, and don't want to do nothing else. But these disciples knew that it was something that they had failed to do. And what we see in this, when Jesus replied, he said, this can be done only by prayer. And I believe in the 
the uh the King James talked about prayer and fasting. And this it says, why can we do this? Jesus revealed the reason for their weakness. This was just a weakness. This was not a complete, you can't do it. No, it was a weakness and they needed to be restored. You know, when you're weak and you're tired, you can't function good. You need to go and rest and lay down. In this case, while they were in the privacy, this was their resting time and to learn what their mistake was. He says, it was due to the lack of prayer and fasting. Y'all see that? The lack of prayer and fasting. Anytime we're taking on a, a, a responsibility and the Lord has given us instructions, we should always pray first and we should fast to make sure that our hearts and our minds are set in the right place for the glory of God. And it says, it says that it isn't that prayer and fasting make us more worthy to cast out demons. It is that prayer and fasting draw us closer to the heart of God. They put, uh, they put us more in line with his power. This, when, we, when we fast and pray before we re, uh, jump out to do something, that's putting us closer to the heart of God who gives us the power to do these things. Uh, this is an expression of our total dependence on him. The him is we are dependent on God. We're dependent on the Lord Jesus. We're dependent on the Holy Spirit for guidance and for our strength to do things. And then I, something that I've read and I read, it says Jesus had already given the authority to cast out demons. Now you can find that in Mark 3, 14 and 15. Yet the authority that Jesus had given them was effective only if exercised by faith. Don't you jump out there doing something. You got all power and you can do it yourself. Keep your hands in God's hand. Have faith that this is God is going to make this come about through my faith in him. And it says, but faith must be cultivated through spiritual discipline and devotion. Discipline. Study, pray, fast, discipline, and devotion. Remember where your power comes from. The total dependence on God is the remedy for many spiritual problems. To be disappointed in yourself is to have trusted in yourself. So when you are disappointed because something that you had planned out and you thought it was going to work and it failed, Look, you did that. You should have put God first, ask him for guidance and understand it. And that to remember that we can do all things through Christ who strengthened us. We can't do these things on our own. We can't be strong Christian followers. We can't be believers. We can't be messengers for God if we're doing it on our own. But through Christ, through God, through the Holy Spirit, we can conquer and do many things as long as it's in the will of God and we pray and fast before we move. And we should pray while we're moving. Amen. This is our lesson. My prayer is that it will benefit you, that you can share it with others. And if you uh, haven't subscribed, please do. And leave a comment if you like. And hit the little thumbs up button so that this platform will know that this is a worthy uh, video that needs to be shared with others. And until the next time, may God bless you richly. And I'll see you on the next occasion.